Currently, there's around 1 million Malaysians residing in Singapore to work. And a recent study has shown that if given the opportunity, 75% of Malaysians will also leave the country. You see, actually brain drain is really a big problem in Malaysia, although we don't really acknowledge it. This is because people are the ones who drive the country and grow the economy. So the question is, how do we make Malaysia better than Singapore so that Malaysians will choose to stay here instead of leaving? So, to answer this question, we thought it's best that we talk to the guy with the opportunity to leave but chose to stay in Malaysia and became an MP instead. Why this side, Sadiq? Thank you very much for seeing me today, right? So let's get straight down to the issue of the day. Now, Malaysia and Singapore has been independent for Absolutely. about the same period of time. Mm. However, during this period, Singapore's uh, average salary growth it's so much higher yeah. as compared to Malaysia. So what happened? What's your view on this? I think from the onset is to acknowledge that we have a major wage issue in Malaysia. Let me give context. Uh. Uh, during the height of COVID, Singapore launched an ambitious plan to get a lot of Malaysian nurses to service the healthcare sector and the salary put up is equivalent to a surgeon in Malaysia. The biggest problem in Malaysia is not unemployment. The unemployment figures in Malaysia is about 3 to 4%. All right. And it's yeah, worse than 4 to 5. Low. It's relatively low to the region. However, the rate of underemployment have quadrupled from 500,000 10 years ago to now about 2 million. Right. Which means that you as an engineer, 6 years of studies, 100,000 ringgit debt, but now you're working in the gig economy which has nothing to do with your job. Maybe like a grab driver Correct. or like yeah. a salesperson in a, in a retail store. So you know, with your kind, skills, right? you are being underpaid and you are being underemployed, you're not being able to utilise it. And that's a major problem. What would you propose to actually solve this problem, Major? Do you yeah. think it's solvable? Yeah, it's definitely solvable. Quickly, three solutions. It's going to be the year 2023 very soon. I know many of you will be thinking about New Year's resolution, setting new financial goals and stuff like that. But we all know it's not easy to plan or achieve those things. So from November to December, we'll be organizing a financial literacy month. There will be free weekly workshops and activities to help you figure out your financial goals, plans and turn it into action for 2023. On top of that, when you attend our workshops, you will stand a chance to win some awesome Apple products as well. So sign up and reserve a spot for yourself via the link below. Number one, we need to immediately help those who do not have the heart to study for six years. And there are a lot of Malaysians, the, the, the stats do not lie. Yep. What do we do to capture them and to ensure that they get a dignified way? I think the Malaysian education system should not just fetishize over a degree for six years, but we need to start subsidizing micro credentials a lot more. For okay. example, if you want to be a social media influencer, a lot of them will just learn online without proper certification. Mm -hmm. You need to learn how to do video editing, you need to know the algorithms, you need to do the ads, you also need to know how to commercialize. There are short three to six month courses which are properly certified, certified by universities in and outside Malaysia. Okay. Government should fully subsidize that if you come from a B60 family. Because mm -hmm. then once you're done, you have a certification, this is something you're passionate about, you also upskill yourself you can immediately access a job without having a 100,000 ringgit debt behind your back and waiting for six years. Right. And even if you fail that six months, you can still recover instead of six years and then joining a job is nothing to do. That's one. Second part, I think government must start allowing for specialization in TVET earlier, technical and vocational education. Mm -hmm. Allow for 15 year olds after their PT3, back um, like then our time PMR, if they already think science is not my path, this is not my path, I want to do technical and vocational education. I like doing the short courses, I like doing hands-on subjects. I want to immediately work because I need to help my family after. Allow for that specialization when the person enters Form 4. And in that two years time, immediately give the person the diploma. Why wait? Right? Every other part of the world is upskilling, reskilling, cutting the fat, moving in the job sector mm. earlier with proper experience and skills. And yet, for us, it's two years, Form 4, Form 5, and after that you have to take a diploma, after that it takes years and years before you graduate. Studies have shown again, with that diploma in TVET, in that two years' time, like once you are done, you start with a dignified salary. Mm. About 2,000 and above, and in three years' time, you can immediately hit 3,004 mm. to 4,000 ringgit. Mm. But you don't have that debt, you don't have that six years of waiting, you already have a proper diploma with you, and on something you should believe in, 
earlier. And I think this is quite similar to the German model. Right? Yep. So that to some extent deals with people who want an immediate job, but a good paying job, that's two. The third part to that, and this is slightly longer, just bear with me. When uh, I was part of government, I fought for an income supplement model, okay. which is um, a lot of developed countries done it, Singapore did it as well. So you can look it up. We got a 6.5 billion job stimulus package passed in the 2020 budget, right before mm -hmm. the government changed. It's called Malaysia Courage. In English, it's called Malaysia at Work. It is meant to deal with the problem of underemployment. I give a simple context. Let's say you are an engineer. You've been underemployed for 12 months. Let's say the company says, okay, because you've been out of the job market for too long, I can only afford to pay you 1,008. Okay, 1,008, which is very low. Mm -hmm. So what government would do is that government would provide an income supplement for the next 12 months, 500 to 700 ringgit. So let's say 1,008, then in the end, you will get 2,500 ringgit. The income supplement will not go to the company because I don't want to help the company, I want to help you. This is a tried and tested model. Why does it work? One, it reduces the cost of employment for companies. Two, the money goes directly to you, which means that you get a dignified wage. That's right. And you get reskilled, upskilled by working in that company with proper experience. Your CV gets better, and your ability to climb up the social economic ladder will also get better as well. Mm. So instead of me giving you a one-off payment of 500, 1,000 ringgit, which often happens now, which doesn't make you climb up the social economic ladder, I reskill, skill you, I work in private sector, but give you directly the income supplement, you get a dignified wage and job, and at the same time, you're able to prove yourself. Many people ask me, but what will happen after that 12 months? Right? That means in the end, then the company will just pay 1,008. Studies have showed, for young people, we just need to get ourselves in the door. Once the door is open, we can prove ourselves. And that's why I believe in the youth of Malaysia. Yeah. Problem today, we're not given the opportunity. Studies have shown that the company will most likely retain you with a higher salary. Because they know now that they have worked with you, they know you, they've reskilled you, and you're more likely to become an mm. asset. Mm. And that's a big multiplier right. for Malaysia. So these are the very three quick things which I'd like to humbly suggest. Right. When I talk to my friends who actually left the country, and I ask them, like, hey, is it just about the pay? They say it's not just about pay, it's also about the problem of opportunity. And, mm. and this is the same across all races, whether they are Chinese, Malay, Indian, or whatever race who actually left Malaysia. Mm. So why is this happening in Malaysia? Because we are building a system based on equal outcomes and not equal opportunities. So what do you mean by that? So equal outcomes means that we create a largely unequal system in hopes that everyone will be equal at the end, which is very vague and ambiguous to begin with, but we are focusing a lot more on the outcomes instead of providing equal opportunities. I'm advocating for a system in which we build a country which is based on equal opportunities. Because you cannot treat, for example, a Chinese family in Parit Jawa, in which the total net income of the family per month is 2,000 ringgit, which is very low, and have five children, cannot send their son or daughter to tuition. Most likely the son or daughter will be working part-time as well yep. to take care of the family. Yep. And then expect that particular family who's living in hardship to get the same grades as a Malay family who lives in Damansara, whose parents earn 15,000 collectively right. a month. So that's where the needs basis comes in. It's a combination of both. The equal opportunities is a fusion between merit and needs. How, how on earth are we going to come up with a policy that actually can combine these both and bring out this value and execute it. It's not easy. I mean, you have to shake the system. If not, why join politics if you just remain <laughs> status quo, right? I mean, and that's what I'll make the case. I'm a Malay, right? And I know that people out there say, oh my God, Sadiq, you're saying this, you're gonna hurt Malay, Sadiq, this. No, I, I, I don't believe that. I think the current system has hurt my community more than ever. See, we've had decades of the same NEP, National Economic Policy, decades. But after decades, of the same preferential, preferential treatment, a quarter of Bumi Putra Sabahans are still living below poverty line. I'm not even talking about B40, poverty line. Mm. Doesn't that signal a great policy failure? When someone from a privileged family, sons and daughters of Datuk Sri's, can still get a scholarship, government scholarship, while my constituent in Moa, in Sri Minanti, comes to me and say that the person cannot even get a place in university, what more a scholarship? despite getting excellent grades and representing the state, where do I put my face? I mean, it is my duty to change that system, right? So if that's not a signal for failure, I do not know what is. And while all of this is happening, the same problematic system is said to have worked while inequality, even among the Malays, the rich and poor is growing from bad to worse. Yes. So it's not just inter-ethnic disparity, even intra-ethnic disparity is getting worse. So it's not, yep just an issue about race and religion. It's also about class, which looks beyond issues of race and religion only. Yeah. So 
a system of equal opportunities must be there. However, I do understand, you are right when you say it's not that easy to change it in totality. But one is we need to have that vision. And then you hit in that vision gradually while following data. We have data. Mm. We have decades of data already. We know, for example, if you ask me, where can we change immediately? All those multi-billion dollar contracts which are said to be given to the Bumis for to help the Bumis get it out. No more. How does giving a multi-billion contract to a multi-billionaire will miraculously make my poor Malay fisherman and Batani better? <laughs> Tell me how. I understand if you say that in engineering, there are not enough Malay engineers. We need to give scholarships to them, help them because currently there's an unequal playing field. But I said, if you do an equ an, a system of equal opportunities, they will be helped anyway because they are the ones who are generally in need. Right. And I'm pretty sure even if I ask you, who may not be a Malay, to say, should we help a Malay families, underprivileged, poor, Oh, but yeah. as a hardworking kid, you say yes. And if you ask me, if there's a Chinese kid in my area who's of that same quality, what I have, I'll say yes. Yeah. But the problem in Malaysia is no longer look. It's no longer depicted that way. It's just depicted all Chinese are rich, all Malay poor. Indians are obviously lost in between. They're forgotten. And then that, that <laughs> system is used to divide us. So I think that's where we need to, to transition. And it must be that proper transition and use data to guide policy making. One thing I like the idea is the fact to going back to focus on education, right? Yeah. That's about like every year 50 to 60 billion Correct. is being put into uh, education on our budget, right? Yeah. Um, so with this kind of money being spent... Um, Brother, it's more than that. Thank you, numbers, huh? <laughs> don't okay. just look, don't, don't, Firstly, don't just look at the Ministry of Education budget. Because in All Malaysia, right. education institutions are divided into six, seven ministries. And the Summa Manusia, billions of allocation. In Malaysia, we outspend Singapore and Japan when it comes to GDP spending, education per capita. In Malaysia, we spend 17% on education per capita. Japan is 7%, Singapore is 12%. But why are we still behind? Despite the government spending so much on education, parents still spend half of the government's education budget through their own pocket money. Oh, because today even Malay middle class parents are willing to spend 25% of their disposable income to send their children to international and private schools mm. yep. because they distrust the system and to me this is worrying mm. and I can't blame the parents they have the right and the choice to do it if we don't buck up the way in which you play catch up is not by adding more years because it doesn't make sense the way you play catch up is by digitizing things we all know when we mm. digitize things we learn so much faster you play catch up faster right. than other countries Singapore's already started by giving quality tablets, hack iPads, but obviously maybe you don't have that kind of money, uh, to those who come from B40 families so that they can tune into online education and it remains with them and they learn a lot of things online. In Malaysia, what I'm advocating for, immediately set aside money to get every single Dajah Satu student a quality tablet to replace textbooks. Because studies have shown the best way to do it, just give that to the kid and the kid knows how to learn on his or her own with quality internet. So you match a quality tablet with quality internet together to every single Dajah Satu kit replacing textbooks and teach the kids how to use it and from there onward, how to learn different knowledge and experience and expertise via online. Let's allow for self-earning at a much earlier age. That's one, which I think must be done immediately. Two, apparently, to me, there is a massive debt trap run by unproductive and not fully certified private institutions. Okay, you may have heard of this. Okay. Let's, Let's say you finish SPM, SPM, you applied to UPU, you, you didn't get, get in. in. You'll notice suddenly you'll get a miraculous yes. letter your house. Congratulations, you've been given a spot to enter this random college somewhere and it is 100% subsidised by PTPTN. Despite the fact that the employment audit of that college or university is like 60-50%. And they give you a course which again will not get you employed. By the time you end, 4-5 years, you have a student that has 100-150,000 ringgit okay. and that's a big problem. Because in Malaysia, education is a business. I'm not going against all private universities. Some are really good, but I'm being strict. Why am I saying that? Because we could have redirected that resource to fully subsidize either micro-credentials which I shared just now, or to go to TVET colleges, but getting multi-skilled. That one, very briefly. Go on. I'm arguing trim the fat, follow international model, where instead of having so many pre-university entrants, which may be unfair and unjust, have K-12, one year kindergarten, 12 years, immediately you finish, you enter university. University, minimum, sorry, maximum three to four years, done. Uh, are you a graduate of public university? Yep, UPM. Okay, then you will remember, definitely you'll remember, because I'm from public university as well, when you go in, you have so many mandatory university and national stuff you have to take. 
you have the titas, you have I don't know, oh, UITM, yeah. you have the kawat kaki compulsory ah, two semesters. Kawat kaki. Kawat kaki. <laughs> you have at times you have to learn all these patriotic subjects again. Yes, yes. All of this, which takes up a lot of your time, pushes your graduation behind, which makes absolutely no sense. If you still don't understand your country, when you are an adult in university, there's something wrong with primary education, <laughs> right? So university should really focus on your core subject. University is about specializing and focusing. That is what the university is about. It's not primary secondary education. My argument is not to ban them or remove them. My argument is make it electives. If you really want to take it, you're an engineering student and you really want to learn kawat kaki in your ITM, great. I'll even subsidize it. But don't force everyone in your class to do it. Mm. Does not everyone want to do it. Another student may want to take entrepreneurship class. Another student may want to learn how to cook. Another student may just want to enjoy his time pursuing his passion in debating or doing internships outside. Yep. When I bring this up, and then they will always be in parliament, friends, either in government or in opposition, will say, Sadiq, it's impossible to do. You'll be labelled as anti-Malay, anti-Islam. But to me, these guys are bloody hypocrites. They are hypocrites because they want to keep status quo in public schools. They don't want to change it. They don't want to change public universities. But these are the same people who don't even want to send their children and grandchildren to public schools. Tadika in France, Sekolah Kebangsaan, which is not Kebangsaan, their early education in Eton College, on all the expensive, fancy uh, colleges in the UK, and then university abroad as well. But then at home, tak boleh, kena kekalkan sistem yang sama. So they're creating an education system, one for the poor and the middle class and one for the rich. So that their children will forever have a comparative advantage against those from the middle class and the poor so that they cannot compete with their children. I think they are damn hypocrites. If they want, if they don't trust our education system and send their children abroad because they think that's much better, sure, I'm not going to ban you from sending them abroad. And I respect your choice to do so. But at least have the courage and the iron in you to change our education system so that we can dream that our education system, even a poor single mother with three children can access the same quality of public education as a rich uh, sons minister. We must aspire for that. I want to sum it up this way. All of this, I think, can only happen if you revamp and overhaul the system, not just making cosmetic changes. Mm -hmm. But I think we must be doing it because I shared there is a decline and we are playing catch up. And when you play catch up, you cannot make cosmetic changes only. Brain drain has been a long-standing problem in Malaysia and it can only be solved via systematic reform over time. And this journey better begin fast before it becomes too big a problem for Malaysia. Now, you may be wondering, what has this got to do with politics, right? Well, at the end of the day, politics is going to affect us all. Whether you get access to equal opportunity, whether you get a good quality of education, and ultimately, whether you get a better pay. So, at the end of the day, we can ignore politics, but politics will never ignore us.